The programme stopped reporting an error at address 44166. Converting all these values to hexadecimal, because that's what the logic analyzer client displays, address 44166 is AC86. The value it found there was 25 hex, but it had been expecting to find FB hex. And by examining the value at this address, we can see that, as is almost always the case, the error occurred on reading that value back during the test and not at the time when it was previously written. Here's the capture shown in the Logic Analyzer client software. The white vertical line is the trigger point, and we can see it sits right where the address bus held the value 7EA2, and that's part of the trigger condition that I set up previously. It's also the address of the first byte of the instruction in line 10. And if we look a bit further up, we can see that at that point, the data bus contained the value ED, which is the first byte of the instruction at that address. I believe the CPU latches data from the data bus at more or less exactly the same time as the read, in this case, and memory request control lines return high. So that's situated exactly in the middle of this period when the data bus held that value. So that all looks good and as it should be. So this means that the test loop has just been exited because the error has been detected. So if we scroll back in time a little to the left, we should see what happened at the point where the error was detected. And I've already marked a few points of note. So if I scroll back to this first vertical marker here, which is at address 7E8A, which is the address of the instruction at line 2. And that's a single byte instruction, its value being 1A. And again, if we look up here, that is what was on the data bus at that time. And right at the top of the display, I've labelled the instruction that corresponds to. So after reading that instruction, the next thing the CPU should have done is to retrieve the value pointed at by DE. And that's at address AC86, and that's where the error was noted. So that's the next cursor here. We can see that the address at this point is indeed AC86. And up here, on the data bus at that time, was 25 hex, the incorrect value. It ought to have been FB. So I'm not too surprised about this, but it's nice to see it confirmed with real hard information like this. And the value on the data bus at this time seems to be quite stable. It's not chopping up and down, etc. Now, of course, if there was a brief glitch or a burst of noise, a logic analyzer isn't going to find that. I'd need to have a proper look in the analog domain, probably with an oscilloscope. And one thing I might try is connecting the trigger output signal from this logic analyzer to the trigger input of my oscilloscope. And then I can have a look and see what was happening to some of these signals at the trigger point. I've repeated that test several times, and the outcome was always very similar. However, now the memory test program has been running, testing banks 2 and 0, for about an hour and a half, without reporting a single error. So what's changed? The only difference is that I've connected the previously two unused inputs of the logic analyzer to the non-contended RAMs row address and column address strobe signals. I've done this because generation of these two signals for the non-contended RAM is completely independent of that for their counterparts in the contended RAM. Also, I've been slightly suspicious that one or both of these signals might be involved ever since noticing that changing IC15 had an effect on the problem, and for another reason. Back to the circuit diagram. Again, these are the non-contended RAM ICs. Their row address strobe signal is supplied by the output of one of the inverters in IC15. When this goes low, the RAM latches a row address. This happens whenever the CPU signals it's making a memory request. After a short delay, due to capacitor C61 discharging through R68, this input to IC10 on pin 35 will also go low. 
No doubt this then causes IT10 to generate a column address and to pull its column address strobe output low, provided the memory request is intended for one of the non-contended RAM banks. Connecting the logic analyzer to these two control signals would have added a bit of extra loading to the outputs driving them due to the analyzer's input impedance and the capacitance of the connecting wires. This will have very slightly slowed down transitions between the two logic states and so slightly altered the times at which the RAM perceived these changes to happen and quite possibly changed the duration of the active low pulses. One would hope that in a well designed system such small changes wouldn't have an effect. Note that the changes are very small compared to the time periods between the transitions. However, the presence of this 180 picofarad capacitor C80 suggests there's a problem in this area of the circuit. It isn't usual to connect a capacitor to a logic signal in this way, and I suspect it was added as a last minute change when it was found at least some of the plus two prototypes or early production models experienced errors when accessing non-contended RAM. The small changes it causes to the timings of the column address strobe signal must have been found to be just enough to avoid the problem. In fact, during my earlier examination of this signal with an oscilloscope, I noticed the rise times were slightly but noticeably longer in the working plus two I used for comparison. So next, I will check that C80 is not faulty, and perhaps try adding a bit of extra capacitance if it isn't. I'll also check these delay generating components up here. Another possibility is that the fault is due to occasional interference on one of these control signals, perhaps due to crosstalk from one of the address or data lines. The extra capacitance caused by the logic analyzer connection might have been just enough to reduce this to a level that doesn't trigger the fault. Such crosstalk could be occurring because of damaged connections or circuit board contamination, and so I still might have to remove a good number of the IC sockets to see what they're hiding. First of all I removed capacitor C80, this is it here, and so far as I can determine there's nothing wrong with it. Wanting to make absolutely certain there wasn't a problem caused by any damage on the circuit board underneath these IC sockets, I removed all eight of those and was pleased to find that there was nothing particularly untowards underneath. As previously mentioned, there are a few cases where the copper pad surrounding a mounting hole on the rear has gone missing. Some of those were for the single unused pin on each of these ICs, so they don't, those don't matter. But in a couple of cases, I soldered down a fine wire to the appropriate track on the top side and fed that wire down through the hole so that it would become soldered to the socket pin when I refitted the sockets, which of course I have done and have reinstalled the RAM ICs. That done, I thought I'd try fitting a new capacitor for C80, even though, though I couldn't find anything wrong with the original. The nearest in value to 180 picofarads I could find was 220 picofarads, so I fitted that. Sadly, that didn't seem to clear the problem, but while experimenting, I noticed that the memory faults seemed to go away if I had my oscilloscope probe connected to the column address strobe line, in other words, across capacitor C80. So noting that, I thought I'd try increasing the value of C80 a bit further still, and after a bit more experimentation, I fitted this capacitor here for C80, it's a 470 picofarad capacitor, and with that in place, it looks as if the intermittent memory faults have gone away, though I want to pr perform a more prolonged period of testing to make absolutely certain. I made some records of the effect on the column address strobe of different values of capacitor for C80, I let the oscilloscope work out the rise and fall times and the pulse width. You can see the values on the right hand side. So the effect is only fairly small, but with the 470 picofarad capacitor in place, the rise and fall times are increased by a few tens of nanoseconds, and that should have the effect of making the column address strobe pulse happen slightly later in time than it would have done otherwise and that seems to be enough to cure the problem. So it seems that in the design of the plus two, the timing of the column address strobe is very close, just on the boundary between what will work and what won't. And for some reason, the value of capacitor C80 that usually works to correct that problem isn't quite good enough for this particular plus two.
Of course, there's a limit to how much signals can be delayed by adding capacitance like this. Once the RAM ICs experience very extended rise and fall times on their column address strobe inputs, then they may start to malfunction again. Also, IC10 has to source and sync the current that charges and discharges C80. Should this become large enough, then it may well begin to misbehave, and might even be damaged in the extreme case. I haven't investigated these components here that set the delay between the row address and the column address being presented to the RAM, and it's possible that a problem there could be causing that delay to maybe be too short or too long. I don't know whether the fault was that the column address strobe was starting too soon or finishing too soon. However, with the, if the new value of C80 really does seem to have cured the problem, then I think I'll leave it at that. With the new capacitor installed for C80, I have had the RAM test program running again for a total time of 4-5 to five hours. I've had it test all banks, and it hasn't reported a single error, so I think I can finally be relieved and consider that fault to have been resolved. You might also notice that I've installed a couple of heat sinks, one on the ULA here and another on the AY sound generator. I was a bit surprised when I first opened this computer to find there wasn't a heatsink on the OLA because I've not seen a plus two without one before. Now having had this computer on for many many hours, neither of those ICs have become unreasonably hot so I don't think the heatsink is strictly necessary, but it can't hurt to add one, and it would be particularly inconvenient if the OLA were to fail. And given that the AY chip gets at least as warm as the OLA, I thought it would be a good idea to give it a heatsink too. You might remember that back in part 2 of this video series, I replaced IC3, this one back here, which is the line driver IC for the output lines in the serial and keypad ports. I replaced it with one taken from another plus 2 and ran a test program that confirmed that the replacement was working. However, I've been slightly unhappy because after the computer's been on for quite a while, that IC was getting really quite hot. So I very recently obtained some brand new 1488 line driver ICs and one of those is fitted now. I've run the test program again to verify the new one does work as it should and it doesn't get at all warm. And looking at the external power supply which is still supplying 9 volts but the current draw has decreased by about 80 milliamps as a result of fitting that IC so I'll leave the new one in place. I've reconnected pin 15 of IC6 here so now the lock bit of the memory configuration register should work again as it's supposed to. I think I'm now almost ready to put this computer back into its case. There's only one major feature that I still haven't tested, and that's the joystick interface. As is noted on the outside of the case, only the rather horrible SJS1 or SGS2 joystick should be connected. So I've got one here, so let's plug it in and see whether it works. The computer's in the 128k basic editor, and the joystick interface in the Plus 2 implements the Sinclair interface standard that maps the joystick to numerical key presses. So if I move the joystick, we should see numbers crop up on the screen. All four directions and fire generator response there. So that port seems to be working. I'll check the other one. That one seems to work too. I've seen reports that connecting the more common type of joystick that follow what became known as the Atari standard to the Plus 2 can damage its joystick driver IC. Obviously I'm not going to perform an experiment to see whether that's the case, but fortunately it isn't very difficult to make up a simple adapter that allows that type of joystick to be used with this computer. It's time to start putting it back together again. When I removed the keyboard from the case, I found that this plastic post here had broken off, so I've glued that back in place. And it looks as if the keyboard had taken a nasty blow at some point. This is where that screw was, and you can see this back plate is rather distorted. But uh, 
I imagine it'll be possible to bend it back. Like the rest of the case I've washed the keyboard, it's safe to wash this part but care must be taken not to damage the springs on the underside. There would originally have been a large rubbery block here to help hold the heatsink in place, but that's gone missing. Fortunately the heatsink seems to uh, stay down reasonably well without it, so I don't think that'll matter. On the underside it was missing all but one of its original rubber feet, so I've left that one off and instead I fitted these four stick-on feet over the holes where the originals would have been. <laughs> 